morning. morning. I'm only a minute late. Y'all give me a break. All right. We're so glad you're here to worship. It's Sunday morning. I don't know how we're going to uh, live up to last Sunday. If you weren't here, you missed it with all the kids and the VBS celebration. We just finished, what do we call it? The best week of the year. And it was. It was really a good week. But the reason we do that, hey, I'm sorry. I'm being still. I'll try not to move. So the reason we do VBS, one of the many reasons, is to reach out to the community and, of course, to have an opportunity for the kids to come in and learn something about Jesus. But probably a more important reason we do things like VBS is so that we, the congregation, get to experience what it feels like to love others unconditionally and to actually do a little hard work for Jesus. When you work hard for your faith and you're doing stuff, I mean, you're already saved by faith, but our works give us an opportunity to reveal and practice what the Word of God is doing in us. So thank you so much for living out your faith and helping us with Vacation Bible School. Um, again, another opportunity to live out our faith and mission. Let's go ahead and open the service in prayer. Lord God, we are so grateful for today. So we take a moment, we pause, and we breathe. We breathe and we feel the very life that you've given us fill our lungs. We breathe and we realize that it was your breath that created all of creation out of nothingness. So Lord, recreate us today. Make us new. Use this little short time we have together to build us up, to give us strength and hope that we may truly live out our faith in the world. Lord, teach us to love and to love in a way that lasts. That is our call for today. And we proclaim this as the truth of Christ. Amen. 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 Let me be seated. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the gift of music. We thank you for the way that your word is given to us in so many ways. So as we reflect on this song and, and how you're with us now and have always been and will ever be, let us trust in the word we're about to share that it may be the transforming a vehicle that you created it to be, that we may open the gift of this word and be surprised and receive joy and hope as our lives are transformed. Thank you, Lord, for being you and for loving us, for being us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, the scripture today, this is the end of our Genesis series. If you remember, we've been in this series about um, God and, and the actions that God uh, forms on our behalf. And today, Genesis 24, I'm going to start with 34 and 38, then I'm going to read a couple more passages to you later. We're going to start with Genesis 34, 38, and this is, like we mentioned children's sermon, Abraham is sending out his servant to find a wife for Abraham's son. <clears throat> Verse 34, the man said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has richly blessed my master, has made him a great man, has given him flocks, cattle, silver, gold, men servants, women servants, camels, and donkeys. My master's wife, Sarah, gave birth to a son for my master in her old age, and he's given him everything he owns. My master made me give him my word. Don't choose a wife for my son from the Canaanite women in whose land I'm living. No, instead, go to my father's household and to my relatives and choose a wife for my son. Now, in a society like ours, where eHarmony.com, ChristianMingle.com, FarmersOnly.com, right? Tinder and internet dating are just considered normal. The whole notion of Abraham sending his Manservant out to a foreign land to find a, a wife for his son seems remarkable. But it was perfectly normal behavior for a culture that understood that healthy marriage took more than romance and physical attraction. It took more than that to thrive. They realized that committed relationships, the commitment and a love that fostered commitment, that's what made marriages last. Today, the use of the word commitment has been so 
misused, abused, overused, that there's a misunderstanding as to the best way to apply that or to use that, particularly when we talk about relationships. Commitment is generally applied. And we can be committed just for as long as it's convenient, and then it seems like it's okay. The concept of commitment lies in the truth of the Scripture. That commitment is about the ability to trust someone. To really trust them. To do important things on your behalf. In verses 34-38, through 38, we hear that commitment opens our lives to friendship. Friendships draw people closer together. They bind our human hearts. And it does this through sharing sacrifice through our common experiences. Now, Scripture here doesn't tell us the name of Abraham's servant, but it does indicate that he was the chief servant. He was the one who had served Abraham the longest and was probably more than a servant, but a confidant and a real friend, a man of integrity whom Abraham could entrust in this very, very important task. Everyone should have a person like that they can trust and lean on when they really need something important. In his book, Windows of Hope, Windows of Hope, Richard Lee writes about two young German artists. This is in the 1400s. And they were roommates and they were going through art school or trying to go through art school and they found themselves in a desperate situation. They truly were starving artists. They could not eke out a living to support themselves, to pay their rent, to buy food. So one of the friends named Hans, he made a drastic decision. He concluded that he would drop out of art school, he would go to work, and he would pay for his friend to go to school. And then once he graduated and he was able to make a living, then he would pay for Hans to go through school. And it was a hard decision, but that's what happened. Hans laid aside his brushes and all his paints, his canvas, and he went to work, hard work. He labored, earned money, paid for his friend to go to school. He graduated, and true to his word, his friend, a man of integrity, says, now it's time for you to go back to school. And he himself went and enrolled his friend Hans in school. However, the years of manual labor were not kind to Hans. Although his heart was beautiful, his fingers and hands become calloused and arthritic. He just no longer had the ability to be the artist that he once could be. He knew that spending this money on art school and trying to become an artist in, in, to the point of making a living was just a waste of money. So he told his friend, this isn't going to work. I'll just go back to the factory. I'll go back to work doing what I've always done. Now his friend, his name was Albrecht, and he was devastated. He felt so bad because he really wanted to help out his friend. So he said, you know, I'm going to talk to him one more time. Is there anything I can do? So he went to his friend's room and he heard him talking, yet no one was in the room. This is how the story goes. So he peeks into the door. And there's his friend, hands folded at a table, praying to God. Here's a picture that was a result of that incident. You may recognize it. Albert painted that. And, and look, if you look up the this, this story online to, to check me, there are five different versions of this, of this story. This is the one that fit my sermon the best. So I'm just gonna, uh, well, the only difference is one says it's his brother, not just his roommate, but that's about it. Yeah. But yeah, so he painted the picture. It sold. People loved it. it you've seen it. It's now, it's, it's carvings. It's ceramic. It's in paintings. It's been recreated over and over again. This is all Brit's version. He actually made the paper. That's why it's blue. Now this, it's been recreated, I told you, right? Um, in art school, well, not art school, but in, in college, my daughter Amy had to take an art class, and one of her assignments was to pick a great work of art and copy it. So this is her interpretation of all Brit's. Amy did that. I told her I liked it so much, I wanted her to draw one for me, which she never did. Now she says it's too long ago, and I don't know how to do it, so I'm just going to take her original. That's all there is to it. 
I'm the dad. I said so. I want it. Anyway, so Amy did this one. Just to show you, it's been recreated. Countless copies. I've seen the sculptures. I've had a little wood one sit at my desk for a while. I don't know what happened to it. But all these recreations, every time you see one, what we're really looking at is a dedication to a dear friend. This is drawn by someone who, whose heart was broken and he wanted to try to capture the sacrifice that his friend made for him. Albert became very, very successful. He was selling well, and you can still find his works online. And they were treasured throughout the years. Let's go ahead and look at the, the next scripture. Albert and Hans had the kind of friendship that lasted. They were really committed to each other. In verses 42 and 49 of our scripture, we hear that commitment opens our minds to God. Not just to one another, but to God. Let me read this to you. This is from verses 42 through 49. <clears throat> Today I arrived at the spring, and I said, Lord God of my master Abraham, if you wish to make the trip I am taking successful... When I'm standing by the spring and the young woman who comes out to draw water and to whom I say, please give me a dr little drink of water from your jar. And she responds to me, drink and I will draw water for your camels too. May she be the woman the Lord has selected for my master's son. Before I finish saying this to myself, Rebecca came out with her water jar on her shoulder and went down to the spring to draw water. And I said to her, please give me something to drink. She immediately lowered her water jar and said, Drink, and I will give your camels something to drink too. So I drank, and she also gave water to the camels. Then I asked her, Whose daughter are you? And she said, The daughter of Bethul, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore him. I put a ring in her nose and bracelets on her arms. I bowed down and worshipped the Lord and blessed the Lord, the God of my master Abraham who led me in the right direction to choose the granddaughter of my master's brother for his son. Now, if you're loyal and faithful to my master, tell me. If not, tell me so. Tell me so I will know where I stand either way. A ring in the nose, that's what I had to pause a little bit. I'm not so sure about that. Abraham's servant asked God for direction. That's the important part of this. Don't let me get you off track. He waited for God's reply. And the prayer was answered in the form of Rebecca. The prayer is a relationship. It's a fellowship with God. We need to pray with a clean conscience, which the servant did. We need to ask boldly and confidently. And we should pray expectantly. Expecting God to answer but realizing we may not know or even understand the reason behind the answer. We just must trust God because we have a committed relationship with God. In verses 58 through 67, we hear that commitment opens our hearts to a lasting love. So we first heard how it connected us as friends, and we heard how it connects us to God. Now this is an example of how commitment opens our hearts to lasting love. Verse 58. They called Rebecca and said to her, Will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. So they sent off their sister Rebecca, her nurse, Abraham's servant, and his men. And they blessed Rebecca, saying to her, May you, our sister, become thousands of ten thousands. May your children possess the, their enemies' cities. Rebecca and her young women got up, mounted the camels, and followed the man. So the servant took Rebecca and left. Now Isaac had come from the region of Bishaloa Ra and had settled in the arid southern plains of that area. One evening, Isaac went out to inspect the pasture, and while staring, he saw these camels approaching. His servant had been gone a while. But on one of the camels was Rebecca. And Rebecca was staring at Isaac. Their eyes met. She got down from the camel and she said to the servant, Who is this man walking through the pasture to meet us? 
The servant said, he is my master. So she took her headscarf and covered herself. The servant told Isaac everything that had happened. Isaac brought Rebekah into his mother Sarah's tent. He received Rebekah as his wife and loved her. So Isaac found comfort after his mother's death. Abraham's servant found the answer to his prayer. He discovered the woman God wanted for Isaac. And there's this anticipation in her response. Well, will you go with him? I like that because even in that culture, they did not say, you are going. They gave her the choice. Will you go? And after her positive response, there was the thrill of the trip back and the anticipation of Isaac's response when he sees Rebecca. At the end of the journey, the result of the servant's commitment and friendship with his master was rewarded. And the result was a fulfilled love. Isaac and Rebecca. It's a wonderful love story. Verse 67 says, Rebecca became his wife and he loved her. When I was writing, the, read this and was writing this and said, you know, Wednesday, the title of the message was Can't Buy Me Love. And here he goes, he loved her. I could have made this a Beatle themed series, right? Yeah. And he loved her. This is about commitment, particularly commitment within marriage. We can learn a lot. From this. Now, there are a lot of things about marriage we don't want to learn from the Old Testament. But this is an example of commitment within marriage and how it opens our heart to God. It opens our heart to loving, to lasting relationship. Without true commitment, marriage is simply a legal procedure. It's an arrangement. But with commitment, it is a divinely ordained link between two people is rooted in love for one another and the love for God. In pre amen, that's right. In premarital counseling, I always tell people, three people are getting married on your day. The two of you and God. Marriage is always a three person commitment. And when people come to me when their marriages aren't working, one of the three people has always been faithful, has always been true has always been trustworthy, has always done their part in the marriage. So which one of you two are messing up? Because it's not God. But God's the one that can bring it back together. There is no marriage, no matter what it's gone through, no matter how bad, no matter how the trust has been broken, no matter how horrible, there is no marriage that God cannot heal. There's plenty of marriages that people can't heal. With commitment. Marriage is a beautiful, beautiful gift. And so, in our relationship with God, we experience God's love in its fullest when we are committed to God. We know the richness and the depth of God's love for us when we are committed to God, like God is committed to us. Churches realize the fulfillment of their purpose in their community when the church is committed to God. Because God's always committed to the church. So like Rebecca, Christians, from the beginning of the time we became Christians, and even before that, in God's people, Israel, we've always been confronted with a question. Same question that was given to Rebecca. Will you go? How do we answer that question? How do you as a follower, disciple of Jesus Christ, how do you answer the question that God's asking? Will you go? Will you come? Will you be committed to me? Will you be committed to loving others so they may know me? Let's pray about that. Lord God, we do love you. I know we don't show it the right way sometimes. We are human, and there's no excuse, but we are flawed. We are sinful. At our best, we're still not perfect. But you are perfect, Lord, and you love us unconditionally. So we ask, Lord, for mercy. And we are so thankful that you are a compassionate God. 
The Lord Jesus, we ask You that You forgive us of our sins and that we never take lightly the sacrifice You made so we may be forgiven, renewed, transformed, so we may truly be devoted, committed disciples. That's our prayer today, Lord. You say, will we go? And we say, here we come, Lord. Where do You want us? How do You want us? Who do You call us to serve? Because we're coming. We're here. We want to serve You. So take us, Lord. Take those of us who who are Your servants and claim to be and have known You. Take us and help us build Your kingdom. Just as You sent um, Abraham, You taught to him, and He sent His servant out to find this committed relationship. Send us out so we may bring others into this marriage. So we may find people that want to join You and love You and be loved by You. We are Your servants, Lord, and we go. We are the bride of Christ, Your church, and we go. Lord, if there's someone here who does not know that to be the truth in their life, if there's someone that has heard about You but they, they have not answered that question, why not today, Lord? As we pause and just give a moment for Your Spirit to work, if there's anyone that is ready to claim Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, let today be the day that they say, I am Yours, Lord. Take me. Change me. Forgive me. Remake me in Your image. Well, Lord, hear our prayer. Forgive us, Lord. Have mercy, God. Lord, we give our lives to You. Take us. Remake us. Love us. In the name of Jesus Christ, know that You are saved and taken. You are the bride of Christ. Know that today is a day that, that You answer that question and we all go with Christ in a committed, loving relationship. This is the truth of God's Word. This is the truth written in our hearts and lived out in our lives. In the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.